Okay. So we get a double portion this week. Hukas Balak. In Israel, they only read Balak. Today we catch up with Israel. And the um, so Tuesday we discussed Tuesday we discussed the Parsha of Chuka, the red heifer, and today we'll discuss the uh, Parsha of Balak. And it's interesting that the prophecy, the main prophecy from Mashiach, is actually in this week's Parsha by a non-Jewish prophet, Bilam. All the prophecies question why would such the greatest most exciting prophecy, the most relevant prophecy, says all the prophets are filled with the coming of Mashiach. But in the Torah, the main mention of Mashiach is in the through the mouth of a non-Jew, a non-Jewish prophet, Bilam was actually a great anti-Semite as well, and very corrupt. So why such great prophecies, such holy prophecies, come from the mouth of Bilam? You can ask the same question on the origin of Mashiach. The origin of Mashiach seems to come from very unholy origin. Because where does Mashiach come from? Mashiach is a descendant of Ruth. Ruth, the Moabite, who converted, married Boaz. This was the great, great, great grandmother of King David. Who Mashiach is the son of David, a descendant of King David. And who are the descendants of Moabite? All the descendants of Moabite are descendants of incest. Because Light had two daughters, and they, when Hashem destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, they hid in a cave, and they thought the whole world has come to an end. So to continue the human race, they decided to get their father drunk, and the oldest daughter went the first night, she got her father drunk, and she had incest with her father. And she named her son Moab, which means in Hebrew, Me'av, that this son comes from my father. <laughs> his grandfather is his father. His, my father and he, we, my, my son and myself, share the same father. It was incest. And she had no shame. She was very proud of it. She put it in the name. The next night, Light allowed himself to get drunk again. And again, the second daughter, the younger daughter, had relations with him, and she named her son Amon. She hid the fact that it was a result of incest. And that's why, that's why Hashem also, later on, commanded the Jewish people, you're not allowed to conquer Moab, but you can start up with them. Like guerrilla warfare, but you can conquer them. But with Amon, don't start up at all. Because Moab was so, had that quality of chutzpah, she, the whole origin was incest, but she was also very proud of it. She paraded it in public. So the whole origin of Mashiach comes from a very, from incest. That's from the side of the mother. From the father's side, King David's father, Yishai, who comes from Judah, the tribe, the head of the tribe of Yehuda one of the sons of Yaakov, he was the lion, the king, and he had relations with his daughter-in-law, <laughs> Tamar. He thought she was a prostitute. Turned out she was his daughter-in-law. And as a result of that, he gave birth to Peretz. And Peretz was the ancestor of King David, of Yishai, of King David of Mashiach. So from both sides, Mashiach comes from very uh, questionable and unholy, unholy source. So why does something so holy have to come through such, uh, such unholy uh, you know, the great uh, 
Hasidic master who is the Alter Rebbe's like mentor and Rebbe, colleague, mentor, Rebbe, after Rabbi Dover passed away and after his son, Rabbi Avram the Angel, passed away. So Rabbi Mendel of Vitebs or, or Mendel Haradaker was appointed like the chairman of the, he was like the, the mentor of his colleague. And the Alter Rebbe followed him in a way like a chassid, like a, 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 a colleague, chassid. And um, he used to dress very cool, very, very fastidious about his dress. And uh, they said about him that the reason why he gets dressed he says, if you want to hide your jewelry, where's the best place to hide your jewelry? What's the, where's the safest place to hide your jewelry? You know what the safest place to hide your jewelry? Where no one, no one would even think of looking? In the bathroom. <laughs> no one is going to put jewelry, hide it somewhere in the bathroom, under the bathroom sink somewhere. No one would even suspect that. Jewelry you expect to put in a safe in some place. But no one would ever suspect in the bathroom, you're hiding jewelry, the most precious things you're hiding in your bathroom. So he hid his greatness, his modesty, he hid everything in a place that the Satan, the entire wouldn't even suspect. So similarly, when Hashem has to smuggle something into this world that's so beyond, that's so intense, it's so powerful. It can't come in a direct way because the opposition would be too intense. So it has to be like smuggled in. And the Satan thinks to himself, nothing good is going to come out of this. This is incense. This is a, a bottle with his daughter-in-law thinking he's a prostitute. This is, I don't have to waste my time here. I don't have to pay attention here. I already won. It's a done deal. And unsuspecting, out of this comes the greatest light, the most intense holiness. But on a deeper level, we find, it says in the prophet, in Yechesko, Mashiach will come, Hashem is going to restore and return the cities of Sodom. All the cities that were destroyed, four of the five cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Svoyim, Mashiach will come, these cities will be restored. They were once the most lush part of Israel. Today, we're, we're, today is the Dead Sea. It used to be the most lush part of Israel, the wealthiest, the richest. And now Hashem turned it over and it became salt, turned it into salt. Mashiach will come, these cities will be restored. Why will these cities be restored? Why is that an essential part of what Mashiach is all about? Because Sodom represents the negative but very chaotic, powerful forces that we find in, in, in the negative, in evil. But the truth is, the greater something is, the taller something is, the farther it falls. The analogy in the Kabbalah, you have a wall, a very tall wall, and the wall collapses and falls down. The top of the wall, the highest part of the wall, falls farthest away from the wall. So too, the holy sparks that fell so low, that fall into things that are prohibited, prohibited relationships, prohibited food, those sparks are much deeper, much more intense, much more powerful. The holy sparks that fall into things that are just material but are kosher. That's why the attraction to something not kosher is much more powerful than the attraction to something kosher. The attraction to herring is limited. <laughs> <laughs> But the attraction to something is not kosher. 
a non-kosher relationship, it's very powerful. It's very, it pulls you because the energy is a very powerful energy because it comes from a very high source. So Sodom and Gomorrah was totally corrupt and decadent and rotten to the core. But it represents, it actually at the root, at the source, represents a very powerful energy. It's wild, bacchanalian energy, unbridled energy, intense energy, this animalistic energy, animalistic urges, which are much more powerful than a human urge. Human urge is not that powerful. Just like a human being physically is weaker than an animal. That's just a symptom of the fact that our urges are also weaker because we have an intellect and it weakens our desires. We desire things, but it's not with that animal, raw animalistic passion. The attraction and the passion for power and then money and power and fame, it's this animalistic drive, this raw drive is so intense, it's so powerful. Because at the root, it comes from a very high source. And ultimately, the goal, Hashem's goal, is not to destroy Saddam. Today, Hashem had to destroy Saddam. It's self-destructive. Something that becomes absolutely evil cannot survive in the God's world. Chap or Chaz, whatever they call it, uh, lasted four weeks. <laughs> Hitler's thousand-year Reich lasted uh, too long. 11 years, 12 years. Communist Russia collapsed. Communism collapsed. We'll see how long, how long, how long Soviet America will last. Evil cannot last. Evil cannot endure. So it destructs. It collapses on its own weight. It's so rotten to the core. There's no good left to it. There's not a shred of truth or honesty or integrity or morality or kindness or goodness left to it. It just collapses in its own weight by its own lies. It's collapsing very fast. People who have been bending over, in England at least, people who have been bending over and kneeling and endorsing Black Lives Matter. Today, they're all taking it back. They're, they're like in horror. They're all taking it back. I'm sorry, I never said it. I didn't mean it. Uh, but they realize we're dealing with a bunch of thugs and I, uh, radical leftist extremists, gangsters. It didn't take long. Yesterday, they were marching already in Washington. They were chanting, death to Israel. Uh, Jews are killers. Israel are killers. You know, they, you're dealing with anti-Semitic thugs and lowlifes and terrorists and gangsters and murderers. Lawless anarchists, radical leftists. So today, in today's world, we don't even have to wait 70 years. In four weeks, the whole thing collapses on its own sheer weight of its own lies. That's why Saddam was turned over. But ultimately, the goal is Hashem doesn't want to destroy Saddam. The goal of Mashiach is to take that energy, take that powerful, unbridled energy. It's like riding, a, it's like trying to ride a, a lion. It's very dangerous. You probably kill yourself. And you'll be thrown off to your death. But imagine if you're able to ride that lion and you're able to harness that powerful energy. Because when Hashem created the world in the beginning, it says the Nachash, the snake, the original snake that led to the sin, the first sin that tempted Chava and then Adam to eat from the tree of knowledge. And the rest is history. In the beginning, he was a Shamish Hagadol. It says he was a great Shamish. He, he was there to service. Adam rode him. He, he, Adam was able to harness him and he took Adam, he served Adam. Adam was able to utilize a powerful energy. So ultimately, everything in Hashem's world, everything that Hashem creates in this world, it's His world. Everything that He creates is for His own glory. All there is is Hashem. There is no other reality. It's not that holiness is superior to its opposite. There are the two sides, and holiness will always win. There are no two sides. 
There's only one side, and that's Hashem. Hashem Echad is all there is. There's nothing else. Everything that exists, including negativity and evil and darkness, everything in this world ultimately has a godly spark. And the ultimate purpose of everything that exists is to be transformed and to reconnect to its root and to its source and to become a shamish HaGadol, a great service of Hashem. And that is the purpose of Mashiach. That is the goal of Mashiach. The goal of Mashiach is not to go back to the shtetl. To go back to that purity and innocence and snow white innocence. We're completely divorced, disconnected from this world. The whole goal of Mashiach is and that day Hashem's name will be one. He will be one, his name will be one. The entire world, all seven to eight billion people, the Goyim, the non-Jewish world, will be transformed and will recognize the sovereignty of Hashem and become God. Mashiach will come, the ultimate purpose is that even the non-Jews will be fully engaged and transformed and changed. You know, a non-Jew once asked his Jewish friend, he said, what happens if your Mashiach comes and the non-Jews don't accept it? So the Jew responded, a Mashiach that you won't accept, we won't either accept, because then he's not Mashiach. If he's genuinely Mashiach, then he will affect inspire and literally change and transform all 8 billion people. Doesn't matter if they're black or brown or red or yellow, white, everyone, all 17 8 will be changed. And that's why the prophecy of Mashiach had to come through the mouths of a nun. Because that's the definition of Mashiach. Like the beautiful story of Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Vitebs, that we mentioned earlier. He made Aliyah to Israel. And if you heard the story, he was, this was 100 years before Theodor Herzl was born. 400 Hasidim packed their bags, left Eastern Europe, and moved to Israel. The Alter Rebbe was one of them. He reached, he went as far as the Turkish border. And that's where Rabbi Mendel of Vitev uh, um, convinced him to go back, to return to Russia and to lead the Hasidim. At that very early stage of the Hasidic movement, the Hasidic movement was in danger of, it could have withered away without the strong leadership of the Alter Rebbe. And they, first they lived in Jerusalem. It was very difficult. There was nothing in Israel. It was Arab. There was no Palestinians. There was no Arabs. There was hardly anyone there. The place was, you couldn't even sustain yourself. You couldn't even earn a living. The place was a swampland. And they had to be supported by the Jews of Eastern Europe. As impoverished as they were, every family would put aside, Alter Rebbe organized every family, whatever they had, to help their brothers and sisters in the Holy Land, help them sustain themselves, stay alive. And uh, while he was in Jerusalem, the, you know, the Jerusalem syndrome where people flip out. Jerusalem is a very powerful energy. Anyone who's been there could attest to it. And some people can't handle that powerful energy. and They literally flip out. There's a name for it called the Jerusalem syndrome. This one thinks he's the Messiah, and this one thinks he's the King David, and this one thinks he's God. And um, one of these Jews who flipped out decided that he's uh, Elijah the prophet. So he went on the Temple Mount and he started blowing the chauffeur. By the way, last night, seven o'clock, and everyone is still cheering for the hospital workers. I heard on my block someone blowing the chauffeur. <laughs> seven o'clock, someone was blowing the chauffeur. <laughs> so this, this, this uh, you know, I don't, it's not the Jerusalem syndrome, but maybe it's being locked up for four months syndrome. <laughs> you know, it can really get to you. So, um, so he went up the Temple Mount. Now a Jew is not allowed up to the Temple Mount. Uh, everyone in Jerusalem hears 
the sound of the shofar coming from the Temple Mount, they reached the only logical conclusion that this is this is, must be Elijah the prophet blowing his shofar. They got all excited, were running, and they great news. We heard the shofar, Mashiach is here. Elio is announcing, heralding the coming of Mashiach. Elio is going to make this seum, is going to make the conclusion, is going to conclude the, uh, the exile. Mentioning conclusion, next Thursday, we're going to have a next Wednesday evening, we're going to make a seum on, uh, on the whole book of the Rambam, the 39th cycle of concluding the entire Torah, the entire oral Torah, all 14 books of the Rambam. Jews all over the world. So uh, next Wednesday, instead of Thursday, we're going to do next week's class on Wednesday because Thursday is a fast day. Shivasa Betamir. If Mashiach, God forbid, Mashiach doesn't come, it will be a fast day. If Mashiach does come, it will be, be the greatest celebration. So Wednesday, we'll have the class on Wednesday, 7.30, and we'll make a seum, a conclusion of the Rambam, the whole entire book of the Rambam, the whole entire uh, Torah, oral Torah. So... The Rebbe heard this, got very excited. He says, let me check it out. He goes to the window, opens the window, sticks his head out the window, sniffs the ear. He puts his head back, turns to his chassidim, says, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the Mashiach is not here. I don't smell him in the ear. I just don't smell him. He's not here. And later on, they found out that it was this madman the, you know, the town madman who went up and uh, he blew the show. But the Hasidim were very puzzled. Why did the Rebbe have to sniff the ear, open the window, stick his head out the window? He could have smelled the ear in his own room and smell. Does he smell Mashiach? He doesn't smell Mashiach. And then they dawned on them because in the Rebbe's room, he always smelled Mashiach. But the definition of Mashiach is as long as it's limited to his room, then the Mashiach hasn't come yet. The definition of Mashiach is that you open the window will be in the streets. The Jewish people always are connected with Hashem. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem Echad. We say it, we close our eyes twice a day. This is the most fundamental principle of Yiddishkeit. These are the last words on the Jew's lips before he leaves this world, summing up his entire life. Shema Yisrael, Hashem, Elokein. There's only one God. There's only one reality. But this is our life. We live by this. We live this life. Every day of our life. Every moment of our life. We express this truth. Every time we study Torah. Every time we do a mitzvah. Every time we do an act of goodness and kindness. We, we express this truth of Hashem Echad. Every time we celebrate a holiday. Every Shabbat. We're constantly and continuously expressing and living. It's a living, breathing reality for us. The reality of Hashem is a living, breathing truth and reality for us. But as long as it's limited to the Jewish people, within our hearts, within our minds, within our homes, within our synagogue, then Mashiach hasn't come yet. It's only when this idea will spread to the whole entire world, it will be contagious. Like the virus, but in the positive sense. One person in China, somewhere in China, one person, patient zero, got infected. And that one person infected by now probably hundreds of millions of people. I mean, the testing that they're doing is just a fraction. Most people have it and they don't even know they have it. And unfortunately, so many people died. From one person, it, it spread, it's infectious. Until today, there's no cure for this infection. How much more so in the positive? By us doing one mitzvah, one single mitzvah, one Jew doing one single mitzvah, it's so infectious. It's so powerful. And we've been doing this for 3,800 years. Since Abraham, 3,332 years since Mount Sinai giving of the Torah and the mitzvah. So it's so infectious. This energy, this godliness is so powerful that it will infect the whole world when the whole world will realize and become aware and become conscious and connect with the truth and the reality of Hashem. That's when we know Mashiach.
And that's why it says Hashem is incomplete. His name is incomplete. His throne is incomplete until Mashiach comes. Only then will his be complete. Why? Question is, why? Why is Hashem incomplete and his throne is incomplete until Mashiach comes? Why isn't it enough? You have millions of Jews who put on tefillin every day, who pray three times a day, who keep Shabbat, who study the Torah, who study improving, changing, being kindly, so much chesed, so much kindness, so much sad, so much goodness. Why is it important? Why is it so critical? That God is incomplete and his name is incomplete, Hashem until Mashiach comes. And the answer is, you know, the Kotzke Rebbe once asked his Hasidim, he says, where, where is God found? So they said, what do you mean, Rebbe? God is everywhere. There's no place empty of Hashem. And the Kotzke Rebbe says, no, you're wrong. God is only where you allow him to enter. You allow him to enter into your heart, into your conscious mind and heart, there and then God exists. So if you say that God is truth, right? God is emes, Hashem is emes, is an absolute truth. What is the, the definition of emes? What is the definition of absolute truth? Absolutely, 100%. Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Mem, the middle letter, and Tav, the final letter. That means it's absolute, meaning 100%. So if you tell me that there's one human being alive on earth, that in his mind and in his heart, Hashem does not exist, he couldn't care less, he's not thinking about Hashem, it's not a factor in his life, it's not a reality in his life. He just, it's irrelevant to his life. He's a self-made man. He's an American, a rugged individual. He doesn't need God. So you're telling me that God is not an absolute truth. Yes, he exists in the heavens. All the angels, the infinite angels, recognize and aware of Hashem and worship Hashem. He exists in Crown Heights. He exists in Borough Park, he exists in Williamsburg, he exists in Muncie, he exists in Jerusalem, he exists in the Shul, in Jewish communities all over the world. But in the minds and the hearts of 8 billion people, he doesn't exist. So then that's a direct contradiction to the essence and the truth and the absolute truth of Hashem. Because then you're limiting his existence. You're saying he only exists in certain areas. But in one person, even if there's one person alive, and in his heart and his conscious mind, Hashem doesn't exist. Hashem is not a living, breathing reality. That is a direct contradiction to Hashem's essence. So therefore, Hashem is incomplete. His name is incomplete. And that's why Mashiach is so essential. It's not just a nice dream. It would be nice if Mashiach comes. Of course it would be nice. No one can argue. It would be beautiful. Imagine a moral world, an ethical world. But it's not a question of being nice. It's essential. Till, because without that, Without that, it doesn't exist. Without that, it contradicts Hashem's essence. Because if Hashem is real, then it has to be 100%. If Hashem is real, He can create a world like ours. 
in heaven, God imposes himself, so to speak, in heaven. Because everything there is so transparent, everything there is so crystal clear, that it's obvious that Hashem exists. You can't deny Hashem. You can't be an atheist in heaven. You, when you see, when you see godliness, it's not even an option. There's no free choice in heaven. The truth is so light, is so illuminated, is so illuminating, is so transparent, it's so obvious. When you see it, you don't have to have faith. It's so crystal clear. But Hashem created our world in which the essence of Hashem is not is hidden. We don't see godliness. We barely perceive godliness. We barely understand godliness. If anything, we're just aware of God's existence, but we don't really understand what is godliness. We can barely understand what is spirituality. We've never seen our soul, let alone to understand godliness, let alone to see godliness. So godliness is hidden and concealed. So much so that people could go through their entire life and they're so engaged and so self-absorbed that they don't even think about God is so irrelevant to their life. They're not even against it. They're not for, they're not against. It's completely irrelevant especially when you're older and then you become more entrenched in your ways. They were discussing how this whole coronavirus which shook up a lot of people and made many people re-examine all their underlying assumptions. People were forced to go back to their families and really question and really start thinking seriously about life. But they did a study, it's fascinating. The older generation, they didn't change as much. You know, you set in your ways. You're not a, you don't have the energy to start re-examining of course, there's no such thing. You can always change because you're, you're as young as you are in your own mind. But it's just human nature. Human nature, you're just too comfortable. You're too rigid in your ways and you're not open to change. It's very it's much more difficult to change. So you can go through your entire life and you don't even give it an afterthought. Godliness, truth, emes, Torah, mitzvah, the Holy Land, the Jewish people, the purpose of creation, the purpose of life. What's the godly divine purpose? You can go through your entire life and live a comfortable life and it doesn't even bother you. These questions don't even bother you. You don't even give it a thought. You're busy with your barbecuing. You're busy accumulating wealth and money and power and fame and indulging and you're having fun. You're, having, you're, not, you're not even thinking about anything real or anything serious or anything godly. So Hashem created, purposely created this type of setting, our world, in which godliness is completely hidden. And this is the whole purpose. Because if Hashem is an absolute truth, then Hashem is not only true when you're in a shtetl, when you're in a holy temple, when you're sheltered in the desert, or when you're in heaven and you're surrounded by a luminosity and everything is illuminated and everything is transparent. If Hashem is MS, if Hashem is an absolute truth, where do we see that Hashem is an absolute truth? In a world like ours, in our setting, where godliness is hidden and concealed and there are difficulties and challenges and curves from left field every step of the way and tests after test after test. And nevertheless, even in this setting, even in this world, we still choose, willingly choose to acknowledge Hashem, to accept upon ourselves His sovereignty, the yoke of heaven, and to joyfully serve Him and worship Him and connect with him, and bow down to him, and kneel to him. The only one we kneel to is to Hashem. But it's our choice. This vindicate, this proves that God is essence. This is the essence, absolute emiss. That even in a world like ours, now when I went to Russia, I visited Russia, 1986. We were there during the Chernobyl accident. I wasn't in Chernobyl. I don't glow at night. 
we were in, uh, actually we were in Yerevan, Armenia. We started out in Moscow, St. Petersburg. We went to bring uh, Judaism and we had a Seder. We ran a Seder for all the refuseniks who came to uh, Yerevan. Easier to go to Israel from there. And uh, for Pesach, the day before Pesach, or on Pesach, the accident. We didn't find out about it till we left Russia. On British ear, we were reading the newspaper. And <laughs> this, in, in Russia, you don't get news. It's almost like our media. It reminds me of our media. I think the president has it wrong. He has it wrong. He called the media the fake news. He's wrong. It's not fake news. It's no news. It's like in Russia. They don't report it. Anything they don't like simply doesn't happen. <laughs> they don't report it. You like news. You don't like it. You agree. You don't agree. News means something news. Like this Friday, there was a bombshell uh, judgment by the judge in New York. An injunction against Governor Cuomo and against Mayor de Blasio. Because they discriminated against the uh, shoals and houses of worship. That they only in phase two and phase three, they only allow 25% capacity. So they were sued. Because secular businesses are allowed to go 50% capacity. So what right does he have to discriminate against uh, worshiping God? So the judge, before hearing the case on Friday, made an injunction. Put a stop that the government is not allowed to fine or enforce this law because it discriminates. If it's a law, if it's legal, it has to be across the board. You can't decide that black life matters you could demonstrate and anyone who dares opens his business, we're going to arrest you. Or anyone who congregates, we're going to arrest you. That's, that's lawlessness. If it's law, it has to be across the board. It's a story. It's a major story. You like it, you don't like it, you agree, you disagree. It's called news. It's called facts. Just out of curiosity, I just went to all the major media outlets. It never happened. There's no mention. So this was communist Russia in 1986. Welcome to Soviet America. So it was no news. Chernobyl, the biggest, worst accident in modern history. No mention. It never happened. <laughs> it's only when we left Russia that we found out about this minor detail, about this major this major accident. So while we were in Russia, we met with the Tzaddik of Leningrad, Rabbi Itcha Kogan. Um, he's famous as the Tzaddik of Leningrad. And he told us a story. He said that he heard a story from this Jew. This was in the early 70s, during the Brezhnev years. And uh, Russia invited Cantor, an opera singer, Jan Pierce. Remember Jan Pierce? famous opera singer, but he was a chazan. And because he was an opera singer, so Russia is very big into culture, even communist Russia, so they invited him to play, and he's a Russian originally from Russia. His family is originally from Russia. They invited him to come play in the Bolshoi Theater. And his performance was broadcast on Russian radio. And he decided to include in his repertoire some Yiddish songs. <laughs> You know, he can do what he wants. He's, he's invited. He's the star. So he included in his repertoire the famous uh, song by Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Bardichev. It's called the Bardichev's Kaddish. And the song goes in Yiddish. He says that the, you know, the, Russian Kaiser, uh, the German Kaiser says that he is Kaiser. The Russian king says that he is king. And I, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak Bardichev, Rabbi Yitzchak Ben Sada says, that the Skadal, the Skadash, may have that God himself, God is the king, the true king. He said this Jew came home from work in St. Petersburg. Rabbi Yitzhak Kogan told him he heard this from this Jew. He was exhausted, and the radio was on, and he fell asleep. Sitting on his chair on his couch, he fell asleep, you know. But in his sleep, he, he, he thinks he's dreaming. He hears Rabbi Levi Yitzchak Badichev's Kaddish in Yiddish. Soviet Russia, 1970s, from Russian radio. He wakes up and he pinches himself. No, it's real. He's not dreaming. <laughs> it's, 
they're singing this song in Yiddish. He came to the only logical conclusion. Mashiach must have come. <laughs> and then quickly, it went back to the regular broadcasting, so Mashiach got delayed for, uh, now it's already 50 years. But it, it's one thing, if you hear that Blavi Yitzhak by Ditchvis Kaddish in Brooklyn, here in New York, New York, but when you're hearing that Blavi Yitzhak by Ditchvis Kaddish in that setting, in Soviet Russia, communist, atheistic, godless, Soviet Russia, coming out of their radio, their broadcast, it, it, gives, you, it gives you the goosebumps. It vindicates the reality, the truth of Hashem, that it's insuppressible. That even in that darkness, even in that environment, you hear loud and clear the voice and the message and the truth of Yiskadal, Yiskadash, Shmei Rab, being broadcast live in all of its intensity through the official communist Russian radio. So Hashem created this world, our world, which is very low, a world that has a Sodom and Gomorrah, a world that has a prophet like Bilam, a low life, decadent, corrupt, a world with such evil, such corruption, such decadence, such concealment of reality, of truth, of godliness. Because it's only in this setting that the absolute truth of Hashem is vindicated and revealed. The fact that the angels sing Hashem's song, that doesn't vindicate Hashem, that doesn't reveal Hashem's essence. That doesn't tell me that Hashem is an absolute truth, that Hashem is emes, that Hashem is an absolute reality, 100%, not 99.9. Not .9. But when in this world, in our world, like our setting, and yet, we choose to realize and to acknowledge Hashem and to allow Hashem to enter into our minds and our hearts willingly. And all seven to eight billion people will willingly come to choose to acknowledge Hashem and Hashem's sovereignty. Only then will Hashem be whole and His throne will be whole. Only then will Hashem's essence be fully revealed in all of its glory. And that is the whole purpose of creation. And that is why Mashiach is so essential. It's not a detail. It's not icing on the cake. It's not reward. It's much deeper than that. This is the whole purpose of creation. It's only when Mashiach will come that the essence of Hashem will be fully revealed and all 8 billion people will become Noahites and righteous Gentile and every Jew in the world will be a proud Jew and consciously connect with Hashem and connect with the Jewish history and connect with the Jewish destiny, all 70,000 Jews living on the Upper East Side without a single exception. No Jew will be left behind. And all the nations of the world will be eligible, with the exception of Amalek, the Hitlers of the world, the Arafats of the world, the hardcore, incorrigible anti-Semites, the absolute evil of the world, like the tumors of the world, they will be obliterated because they're hopeless. They're absolute evil. They cannot be redeemed. But the overwhelming majority of the world, with the exception of Amalek, they will be redeemed. They will be elevated. They will be transformed. They will recognize Hashem. Every last human being alive on earth will willingly, consciously and deliberately and willingly acknowledge Hashem and allow Hashem to enter into their mind, into their heart, and willingly serve Hashem, joyfully serve Hashem. That's the world of Mashiach, and that's why Mashiach has to come through the mouth of a non-Jewish prophet. That's the whole point. That's the whole point of Mashiach. That a world that has a Bilam, a world of anti-Semitism that has a Balak that's trying to wipe us out, a world with such darkness and concealment and so much challenge, when everything seems to be working, conspiring against us, the tiny Jewish people are trying to do the right thing and trying to do, bring Hashem into the world and look how many difficulties, how much difficulties there are, how many challenges there are. Look how the world is so, the truth is so concealed and so hidden and so obscure. 
And yet in this setting, Hashem's truth emerges in all of its glory and all of its strength and all of its intensity. Then, only then, is Hashem's essence revealed, is confirmed and affirmed that Hashem is an absolute emes, is emes, absolute truth. And that day Hashem, will, Hashem is one, His name will be one. The whole world will acknowledge Hashem. The whole world will recognize Hashem. And the Jewish people will be the teachers and the connectors, those who communicate and connect and teach the entire world the emes of Hashem. Okay. If anyone would like to uh, contribute or if you have any questions or you disagree, please unmute yourself and um, please share with us your thoughts. Jeff, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, uh... Okay, go ahead. I have no comment. Oh. <laughs> Except I heard a beautiful, a beautiful shear tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, Shmuel, Rab Shmuel, what do you say? I'm walking on First Avenue. I, be, I hope you hear me. Uh, yes, we hear you loud and clear. Well, Sam, good to hear from you. Thank you very much for this. Um, for this. Um, when are we going to see you? When are we going to see you in the in the color? I hope you're not putting me on the spot. <laughs> I, I think they're starting phase three already. We're already up to phase three. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah, Look, so looking, nice forward. Looking, fo looking forward. Looking forward. Thank you. Dr. Rabbi, let's see what the Rabbi says. The Rabbi did a big mitzvah today. What was it? A bris. Beautiful. Yeah. One of the Koal boys got married tonight, too. Who, who got married? Baruch. I got a, I got a uh, an announcement that he got married tonight, eight o'clock. Baruch Hu. In Crown Heights. Baruch Hu. Whatever. Really? Mm -hmm. One of the okay. Okay, Mazel Tov. <laughs> yeah, so nice. I know Mazel Tov. Yeah. I have a question, Rabbi. Yes, Hashi. Hello, Hashi. Hashi, how's it going? Uh, it's, I find that a little bit strange and congruous that you speak of, of uh, Balak as a as a prophet, and that he was a he was a non-Jewish prophet. Uh, that part is a little bit I don't. See he was a great prophet. He was he was the equivalent of Moshe. That, that's in what a I'm certain saying. sense. A, a Malak? Malak? No, no, Bilam, 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 Bilam was a prophet, because Hashem said that the. The non-Jews shouldn't be able to say, well, we didn't have any prophet. He gave them a prophet, and look what happened. Bilam himself was corrupt. He was driven by greed, right. money, power, slept with his donkey. I mean, he was pretty, uh, you think of, uh, of, a, of a prophet as basically has, is virtuous, has all these positive qualities. You don't think of a prophet as a... Uh, no, he was like very it. spiritual. He was very spiritual, but you know, spirituality doesn't necessarily mean refinement. You but know, on the you other, remember, you remember the sixties. <laughs> but on the other hand, Rabbi, he 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 told Balak that no matter what he does, Hashem rules the world, and that's what's going to be. Yes, he can't direct. He can't directly go against Hashem. But at least he knew that much. Yeah, that he at least he knew that. Yes. He's he's head ahead of most people today, but but he tried. He wasn't refined. You see, in Judaism, the more you know Hashem, the more you refined you become. The more egoless. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not about money. It's not about fame. It's not about power. You become a refined person. He, with all his spiritual experiences, he had these unbelievable spiritual, mind-boggling experiences that most people never have and never will have. 
Hashem spoke to him, crying out loud. Can you imagine having such an experience? It would change your life forever. It didn't change his. Not only it didn't change his, it just became more arrogant. Yeah, that's it like... his ego. Moshe Kapaya. Yeah, Moshe Kapaya, just the opposite. It fueled his ego. Oh, like look how great I am. So you see, you know, it's like when you eat food, what happens if you don't digest the food? Sick. Not only isn't, not only doesn't the food do any good, I'm it's sorry. counterproductive. It gives you a stomachache. In order for the food to, to be beneficial, you have to chew it, you have to digest it, you have to internalize it. In holiness, when a Jew experiences Hashem, it humbles us, we internalize it, it inspires us, we change, we become better, we become more humble. <clears throat> with, with Bilam, the exact opposite. Every time Hashem spoke to him, the more arrogant he became, the more corrupt he became. He, could, he didn't digest it, he didn't internalize it. Yes, he knew of God's existence, and he said clearly, I can't defy God. But it didn't have any internal effect on him. He remained the same coarse, crass, low life that he was before, and worse. And he was the last prophet because yeah. he, just, he just proved that it's a it's a lose lose proposition. <laughs> There's nothing good that will come out of it. <laughs> uh -huh. I see. Especially yeah. Okay. Rabbi, doctor, what do you say? Okay. Thank you so Rabbi. much for the inspiration. It's it's not Rabbi. enough to uh, to want the Mashiach. You need some chizik and some knowledge behind it. More than emotion, you need something more than that. Oh, you need a Jewish cup. That too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What else? <laughs> so you know, there's no question. There's no question. You know, this Shabbos is Yud Beis Tammuz the birthday of the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, he was released from, from exile, from confinement, from prison. First he was sentenced to death. He was released from prison and then he was totally released and then he was allowed to leave Russia with his whole family and his svarim, his library. And um, it's a very special day, but there's no question, the holiday of redemption, there's no question that what we are experiencing now is Mashiach. You know, it's like, the birthing pangs, right before the baby is born, the pain is unbearable. What we are experiencing now is very disheartening. It's very, it's painful. You know, we love our country. And it's a very, very long, prolonged labor. It's a very prolonged labor. Let's hope the mother <laughs> survives. <laughs> Let's hope the mother doesn't die on the birthing table. <laughs> because we're, we're about to die. You know, we have... We have their knee, Black Life Matters, their knee pressing on our neck and we're choking to death and we're crying. But the, 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 the total collapse, this integration of civilization, the total crumbling of civilization, it's very hard to take. It's very disillusioning. It's very painful. It's, it's, it, is, it is labor pain. It's very, very painful. You know, the Gemara says that Tzadikim asks, Mashiach Shakam, but they don't want to live to see it. It's too painful. To see the total disintegration of society and civilization like we're witnessing now, it just, it's beyond shocking. It's, it's, it's hurtful. It hurts. You know, you don't want to believe that people can be so gullible and so full for something so obviously evil, um, parading as something good. And uh, it's very hard to take. So, but it's definitely, well, clearly, the last moment before Mashiach. Parshas Bilam, it's this Shabbos. This Shabbos is Parshas Bilam. We're reading about the prophecies of Mashiach. All of this is happening before our eyes. It's, we are literally, literally living through the fulfillment of these prophecies. And we are literally in the last moment of exile. Right before dawn. It's the darkest before dawn. If you're up all night, you have to be very strong not to fall asleep. Shavuos night. It's the last half hour that you really have to fight like a lion to stay up. So we are literally the last moment. Those who climb Mount Everest, it's the last few yards. You have to stay strong. Many people just can't make it. They collapse the last few yards. They reach so far and they just can't, can't cross the finishing line. They just can't make it. We are at the finishing line. So it's, it's very hard. It's very difficult.
The challenges are insurmountable, incredible. The nonsense that we have to deal with now, the darkness, the level of lies, the level of evil that we are confronted with now is so egregious, is so, is so shocking, is so brutal, is so indescribable, so evil. It's very hard not to lose your head and not to lose your morale. But we have to be clear that we are literally a second away from the redemption, a second away from the moment of triumph when the truth will reveal because now we're in the Pentium age. So it took communism in Russia, it took communism 70 years to collapse. Now it's collapsing in 70 seconds. <laughs> Chop or whatever they call it. I, I couldn't follow all the names they gave. It's gone. It's finished. It's gone. Finished. It's a shame. It's a blight. All those who are quiet, who supported it, it's the end of their political career. I mean, people, people in Seattle saw this and they, they, they're disgusted by it. It showed what inept, corrupt, completely disqualified people, these mayors, these spineless mayors, spineless government, spineless journalists, spineless congressmen or women have no, no leadership, no courage, no nothing to fall for, this, for these, these gangsters and these thugs and these bums and these lowlights, and lawlessness and anarchy. This fund the police, this mantle the police. I mean, this is, this is, this is, there are no words to describe. There's nothing even to talk about. So, but we have to be strong. We have to realize that we are literally at the last moment. If this is the best that evil has to offer, then you know it's all over. They're scraping the bottom of the barrel. These low lives, this is the best that evil has to offer. Black life matters. You know you're scraping the bottom of the barrel. You know it's all over. It's the last hurrah. And the moment, goodness will triumph. Godliness will triumph. Emmas will triumph. Law and order will triumph. Kindness will triumph. Genuine caring about life matters. All black life matters. All life matters. Real. If, if we're real, after George Floyd, there will be an outburst of kindness that America has never seen before. A unity, a coming together of love. Like after 9-11, there was, a, there was a unity. There was a beautiful, beautiful, all the beauty in America came out. Now all the ugliness in America. All the political correctness has come out. So we, are, we have to hang the tight. We are literally, we live with the Torah. We're reading about Balak because we are reading about redemption. And it's the holiday of redemption. And the birthday of the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe. So this is the, the birthday. This is the holiday of redemption. This is Balak, the prophecy of Mashiach. Hashem is telling us. Hashem, it's a fresh communication from Hashem. Be strong. We're literally a second away. And the next Zoom will be on the Upper East Side of Yerushalayim, together with Mashiach Tzitainu, overlooking the third base on Mikdash. And hopefully we'll have the Grand Kiddush. The Grand Kiddush. Uh, in the temple with the coming of Mashiach now. Everyone have a wonderful, wonderful Shabbos. Again, next week, Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday we're going to uh, discuss the Parsha, Pinchas. Was Pinchas a, a, a zealot or a martyr? Was he a vigilante? Or was he a martyr? Um, and uh, Wednesday night, instead of Thursday, because Thursday is the fast day, if God forbid Mashiach doesn't come, We'll do the Siyam, the conclusion, the 39th cycle of the entire oral Torah, all 14 books of Maimonides. So we'll make a Siyam on the Rambam um, so, so, next Wednesday, 7.30. So, so everyone, have a wonderful, wonderful Shabbos. Shabbos. Enjoy, your, you. enjoy your 4th Shabbos. of July. Shabbos. Everyone thinks the fireworks are because of 4th of July. The fireworks are really because it's the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe's birthday and the day that he was liberated from Stalinist Russia, which is a harbinger of the coming of Mashiach. So the Chavez, everyone. All the Chavez. Chavez. Amen. Thank you. Boom. Oh, who's that?